Uh, my name is Chino Achebe. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, what I shall do this evening is quite simple. I shall read you a passage uh, from my first novel, Things Fall Apart. And then... And then, if you don't mind, I will share with you two recent and illuminating observations from two readers from different parts of the world, commenting on the same passage and things fall apart. My hope is that somewhere in that simple writer-reader interaction, a conclusion or two may emerge bearing on faith and reason. The principal character in the novel I'm going to read from is a strong man called Okunkwo, a man of ambition and achievement, but also a hero flawed by impatience and turbulence. We encounter him in this passage fallen from the heights of fame and success into the disgrace of homicide and banishment from his fatherland. His maternal uncle, who, is, who receives him in exile, does all he can to relieve Okonkwo's pain. But the strong man is crumbling into despair, and his uncle decides to take strong action. His uncle's name is Uchendo. On the second day, Uchendo called together his sons and daughters and his nephew Okonkwo. The men brought their goatskin mats with which they sat on a raised bank of earth. And the women sat on a sisal mat spread on a raised bank of earth. Uchendu pulled gently at his gray beard and gnashed his teeth. Then he began to speak quietly and deliberately, picking his words with great care. It is you, Okonkwo, that I primarily wish to speak to, he began. But I want all of you to note what I'm going to say. I'm an old man, and you are all children. I know more about the world than any of you. If there's anyone among you who thinks he knows more, let him speak up. He paused, but no one spoke. Why is Okonkwo here with us today? This is not his clan. We are only his mother's kinsmen. He does not belong here. He is an exile, condemned for seven, for seven years to live in a strange land. And so he is bowed with grief. But there's just one question I would like to ask him. Can you tell me, Okonkwo, why it is that one of the commonest names we give our children is Neka, Mother is Supreme. We all know that a man is the head of the family, and his wives do his bidding. A child belongs to its father and his family, not to, his, to its mother and her family. A man belongs to his fatherland and not to his motherland. And yet we say, mother is supreme. Why is that? There was silence. I want to Konko to answer me, he said. I don't know the answer, Konko replied. You do not know the answer? So you see, you are a child. You have many wives and many children more children than I have. You are a great man in your clan. 
but you are still a child, my child. Listen, and I shall tell you. But oh, there's one more question I want to ask. Why is it that when a woman dies, she is taken home to be buried with her own kinsmen? She is not buried with her husband's kinsmen. Why is that? Your mother was brought home to me and buried here with my people. Why was that? Okonkwo shook his head. He does not know that either, said Uchendo. And yet he is full of sorrow because he has come to live in his motherland for a few years. He laughed a mirthless laughter and turned to his sons and daughters. What about you? Can you answer the question? They all shook their heads. Then listen to me, he said, and cleared his throat. It's true that a child belongs to its father. But when a father beats his child, it seeks sympathy in its mother's heart. A man belongs to his fatherland when things are good and life is sweet. But when there is sorrow and bitterness, he finds refuge in his motherland. Your mother is there to protect you. She is buried there. And that is why we say that mother is supreme. Is it right that you, O Konkwa, should bring to your mother a heavy face and refuse to be comforted? Be careful, or you may displease the dead. Your duty is to comfort your wives and children and take them back to your fatherland after seven years. But if you allow sorrow to weigh you down and kill you, they all will die in exile. These are now your kinsmen. He waved at his sons and daughters. Do you know that men are sometimes banished for life? Do you know that men are sometimes, sometimes lose their, all their yams, even their children? I had six wives once. I have none now except that young girl who doesn't know her right from her left. <laughs> Do you know how many children I have buried? Children I begot in my youth and strength? Twenty-two. I did not hang myself and I'm still alive. If you think you are the greatest sufferer in the world, Ask my daughter Aquini how many twins she has born and thrown away. Have you not heard the song they sing when a woman dies? Omakalonye, omakalonye, omelonye de loma. For whom is it well? For whom is it well? There is no one for whom it is well. I have no more to say to you. The, the first letter I received was from Susan Brown. Dear Mr. Achebe, I realize that you have probably been asked this about a million times, but I literally gasped out loud when I recently read the lamentation for a dead woman in Things Fall Apart, as it is the direct antithesis of Julian of Norwich's prayer. When I discussed this with my book club, they suggested I contact you directly. So here I am. Is there indeed a connection? My Episcopal priest suggested that I say the Julian of Norwich chant when I was waiting for a biopsy report, as I couldn't clear my head of frightening scenarios. I just stop, couldn't stop think, thinking, if you know what I mean. Surprisingly, at least to me, repeating the chant actually calmed me and freed up my overreactive brain, and it did indeed 
the biopsy was benign and all manner of things were well. This prayer has since become an integral part of my life. And so coming up on the song of grief was really, really amazing to me. Thank you for your consideration. Is there indeed a connection between all will be well and that and there is no one for whom it is well? The answer is yes, there is a connection. There are two perspectives on the same human condition. One is a prayer, the other an instructional manual. One calls on and activates your faith, the other your reasoning faculty. The human mind accommodates the practice of faith and the application of reason. Faith and reason need not be at war, but they can be when we let either of them overrun the jurisdiction of the other. When faith runs amok and invades the domain of reason, we call it, quite appropriately, superstition. When it is reason that offends, we call it heartless, unfeeling. Too much of anything, even a good thing, is to say the least unhelpful. It was interesting that Susan's book club asked her to take the question back to me. Rather like the Supreme Court the declining <laughs> declining to take on an awkward appeal and uh, sending it back to a lower court, <laughs> which, which, which is me. And uh, so I brought it to you, the, the court of public opinion. I would like you to note that Okonkwa's old uncle chose to reason with him, to point to evidence around them, rather than to mysticism or faith. Look around you, he said to his suffering nephew, and tell me what you see. Ask my daughter, Queenie, about the twins she bore. He did not choose to say, let us pray. He chose demonstrable evidence. I hope I will not be spoiling the story for you if I reveal that the old man's valiant effort did not save Okonkwo in the end, but it may have helped a whole community, indeed a whole continent, begin a struggle in self-retrieval, which is going on still today. Now, there was a second question I received a second letter I received, this was two weeks ago, and uh, I, so I received Susan's letter in, uh, in January of this year, and this other person, the other writer, is called Zorika. Um, she, I, I guess, uh, wrote to me two weeks ago. I'm amazed that these two letters should come to me as it were hand in hand, although they are so different. Unlike Susan, Zorika has no difficulty whatsoever with the women's song of sorrow. This is what she says about the end of the, the novel. I do not know if my personal experience, well, my motherland has been torn apart during the 90s, Yugoslavia, I have lost so many dear people in the last 10 years. I don't know whether this or anything else is related to the understanding of the irony and the bitterness of that ending. But I was amazed. And then she says this. I want you to, to listen to this. I want you to know how important the following words have been for, 
for me recently due to challenges that life has made for me. At one moment, rewriting them, handwriting, she says in, in brackets, rewriting them, handwriting, several times saved my life or saved my sanity. I want one more time to write that paragraph. You think you are the greatest sufferer in the world? Do you know that men are sometimes banished for life? Do you know how many children I have buried, children I begot in my youth and strength? I did not hang myself, and I am still alive. If you think you are the greatest sufferer in the world, ask my daughter, Queenie, how many twins she has born and thrown away. Therefore, I want to thank you, and I want you to know how grateful I am to you. Life is tough, and having a great piece of literature that really shows how absurd and tough life can be is an amazing thing. With huge respect and gratitude, Zorika Mihalji Lobik Waka. Thank you.